back? Cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Farboud, and I'm super excited to talk about a very interesting and exciting topic. In my opinion, uh, that is patterns, different patterns of authentication um, in, in, for Internet of Things and in, in IoT applications. Um, Amir and I, Amir, my colleague, and I will present this talk. We are part of a, a research team at Security Compass. We represent Security Compass. Um, a few words about me. I've been in security research for more than a decade. Um, my early background is in electrical engineering, control systems, computer engineering, intelligence, and I've finished a, a long research on use of biometrics for crime reduction. Um, a few words about Security Compass. Security Compass is a security company, obviously. Um, we have different divisions, different uh, business units, including training, advisory, and um, our landmark product is SD Elements that uh, uh, provides security guidelines for developers. It's a, an enterprise uh, security uh, management solution. And uh, what we do is that we research different topics. And in the past, year, past, in the previous years, we have researched different aspects of IoT security, and we wrote different security requirements for IoT. And, that, and all, the, all that research led to this talk. Probably 5% of that research um, has been demonstrated and contributed to this talk. Um, I will start from some general facts for a warm-up. Um, Gardner predicts that there, there would be 13.5 billion IoT devices in 2020. And then I, I'm sure that you can read faster than that I can explain. In 2012, average uh, users used 17 passwords and uh, 8.5 business passwords. And a lot of business um, has been hindered by failed authentication. You can see that for more than 46% are frequently or very frequently have been hindered, uh, blocked for, for authentication problem. And then uh, there was a very recent uh, article, a, a very recent uh, research carried out by NIST that said that people um, are encountering, uh, are face, faced with security fatigue. It means that they don't pay attention to security as before. They have given up because of so many security requirements, so, many, uh, so much security advice. And in my opinion, uh, the single most important aspect of security is uh, access control. And I think that the one big obstacle that uh, we have for the rollout of uh, IoT in the future is access control in IoT. Um, let me ask you, um, ask how many of you uh, reuse their passwords? <laughs> Not too many. How many of you reuse your passwords, but when they, you're asked that you reuse your password, you don't raise your hands? Um, so I told you about our, back, our research that has led to this. We've been uh, researching IoT in the past year, and um, it's been under a, a government-funded project by the government of Canada. And then we looked at different uh, vulnerabilities in IoT, and uh, one, of the, one of the topics that we worked on was authentication. And we looked at different enablers and ideas of authentication, and then tried to build some patterns out of them. Uh, we realized that we are dealing with so many technologies, so many protocols, so many applications, and then they, we wanted to find the common patterns that we saw in them, the common denominator of all of them, because it, was, it wasn't really easy to write security guidelines for everything. You have to, have, you have to classify those patterns, those uh, models into something, and then write security requirements for that, for that thing. So we thought about um, the ways that we could classify those ideas, those patterns, into some specific models. So we, uh, what we are going to do in this uh, presentation is that we, we start with Internet of Things, we start with patterns, and then we look at different ideas and enablers of authentication, and then we um, propose this feature space, a number of features that we can extract from different patterns of authentication. And then we analyze the sec security requirements in those, um, in those cases, and then we see how those patterns are used in different, in practical scenarios in Internet of Things. So we have three phases, um, authentication, IoT, patterns, 
and then we will look at the protocols. What is IoT? I'm sure that you're all familiar with IoT. Um, in my opinion, again, uh, these are things that are new. The, these are new to the landscape that we're seeing. Um, physical access, people have infinite time to break down the system, tinker with the system. Uh, we have very low power devices that don't have uh, much computation powers. Uh, we get emergent behavior. We, we have some behavior that we cannot predict in advance because every unit works uh, separately and the result is something new. Um, something, uh, so, something similar to emergent behavior that we see in the uh, biological environment. And then we have privacy intrusion that um, because we could, using the data intelligence, we can indirect, indirectly infer something from, about someone's identity. And uh, we have denial of service attacks. Um, and then um, one last thing is that we have numerous technologies and protocols there. And then we have to deal, all of these have the problem of interoperability. And then we have to, as security analysts, we have to look at many th different technologies. And uh, that was the problem that we have to look at and uh, deal with in this research and this, um, I'm going to talk about in this, in this presentation. Uh, so what type of authentication needs do we have in IoT? Um, we need to, the people have to authenticate into devices, devices have to authenticate into services, and the services need to authenticate to each other. Um, so what, what, do I, what do we mean by patterns? Uh, so what are patterns? Patterns are uh, reusable solutions to common problems in a specific context. Uh, there are many books on patterns, like um, I'm sure that you have you're familiar with the early work of Gang of Four on um, design patterns. Uh, we're trying to build some authentication patterns. Um, and then self-announcement means that, like, is claiming identity. Um, again, why patterns? Because um, patterns give us common understanding of, of a problem. When we talk to each other, when we name a pattern, we, we don't have to go from the beginning and talk about all the details. When we say pattern A, we, we reach a common understanding. And then when we want to write security requirements, we can write security requirements for the patterns, not for the particular technologies. And then we can extract matching conditions, and then we can reuse information, obviously. And for the pattern, we have to uh, specify examples, context problem, solution structure. This is a very long um, presentation, I have to be very quick. Um, sorry for that. Um, so we tried to identify some features. We, we tried to propose some features for, dif for different authentication systems. And this is the best that we could do. I'm not claiming that we have found the solution for everything. We, have not, we, have not, we haven't found the theory of everything. But looking at different patterns, I think that these are the features that are most use, useful for discriminating between patterns. Uh, I will go through them, and throughout the presentation, we'll see them over and over again. And what, actually, what we are going, we, we are going to do in this presentation is that we will see how these uh, different features make difference in those, uh, for those technologies and, the, and those patterns, and we'll see how those patterns are used in different IoT technologies. Um, so what are these features? Um, you, can, uh, you can use isolated authentication, centralized authentication, and federated authentication. Uh, we'll explain these later. Um, you can, the key to authentication is a shared key that is shared between two entities. And this shared key could be either symmetric or asymmetric. Symmetri symmetric shared knowledge means that you have the same thing that the other side has. So you both have the same things. But in asymmetric shared knowledge, you may have the something that the other side has something that corresponds to that, like private and public key. Public and private key is the common example of that. And then you can directly verify that shared knowledge, or you can indirectly verify the shared knowledge. For example, you can send something to someone to um, encrypt that with their key and then send it back to you. That's called indirect verification. And Another 
very important aspect of very, uh, authentication is building a channel. I'm going to emphasize throughout the presentation that building is a channel, a secure channel, a trustable channel, is as important that, as authentication. Actually, authentication doesn't have any value if the channel that is built after it is not reliable. So, but we have to, we have looked at different patterns and different way of communication interactions between entities, and we, we have realized that we can um, cluster them, we can um, classify them into two um, main major categories. Uh, one is that when you build a channel before you do the authentication, regardless of the authentication, you build a, the ch build a channel and then do the uh, authentication on the channel. Uh, the other approach is that you do the authentication and as a result of authentication, you gain a shared key between you that will be the, uh, the basis of that channel. So we'll see examples of all of these. Uh, so this is our feature space coming from a signal processing background. I like to um, extract features from everything. I want to put everything on access uh, except countries. Um, so we, uh, on, on X, I have direct and direct verification. We have asymmetric and we have secure uh, um, channel before or after authentication. Uh, I use those letters as abbreviation, so if I call channel DSB, for example, it shows that it uses direct verification, it uses um, symmetric shared knowledge, and uh, it establishes the channel before the authentication. And then we have the, those different domains, th those different spheres. If I could show this in four dimensions, I would do that, but because we, have, we are familiar with three dimensions, uh, then I put that dimension on um, in, in a different, I demonstrated that in a different way. And these are four main questions that we realize that we have to ask about ourselves, ask ourselves about any pattern. Um, does the pattern exhaust uh, shared knowledge? Uh, does it transfer shared knowledge too much? Um, um, does it create a basis for channel that it protects against the sniffing and pr prote protects against replay attack and relay attack? And does it provide secret uh, forward secrecy, I'll talk about forward secrecy later. Um, so I think Amir will present the rest of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, before, sorry. Not the rest of the presentation, I think. We'll switch back me? and forth. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm soon celebrating my second year at Security Compass as an application security researcher. Before that, I was uh, and research assistant at Information Security Center of Excellence at University of New Brunswick. Uh, so at this point, uh, I want to uh, describe the, those three uh, authentication topologies we, uh, we showed in, in the previous slide. Uh, the first one and the most simple one is uh, isolated authentication, uh, which means the point is the authenticator is um, bind with the resource. So the, the user simply sends the request and the proof of identity to the, to the resource which acts as, an, as the authenticator. So it's, it's simple request and response. So once it's verified, it gets, the user gets access to the resource. Uh, the, next, uh, the next pattern is centralized authentication in which a centralized authenticator server acts as the the authenticator for all of the uh, entities around. So the user sends the proof of identity, uh, gets proof of authentication, and then using that, like say token, uh, it requests, of, it asks for the resource from the resource server. In, in some cases, in some examples, uh, for example, in SAM, the, the resource also verifies the token with the authentication server as well. So uh, next, we move on to the federated authentication. In federated authentication, it's uh, so different, uh, different authentication domains recognize each other's uh, proof of identity. For example, if service A in domain red is authenticated using the shared knowledge A, that uh, authenticated a user in, with shared knowledge A that user is also uh, authenticated in uh, 
domain B, uh, which which have another services and authenticators as well. So the uh, example is single sign-on we are using every day with Facebook, Google, and other authenticators. So now we move on to the actual authentication patterns, uh, and we uh, put them into different buckets. The first one is password authentication protocol, uh, which is the like very simple one. Uh, in this pattern, the client uh, sends the uh, username and password directly uh, without no secure channel clear text to the server, and the server responds. Very simple. Uh, so the, we, call, we call this pattern, we put this pattern in the S0 category, which means the authentication is direct. Uh, that means the client sends the credentials over the channel to the server, the actual credentials. And then it's symmetric because server and client both know the same shared knowledge. And there is no, we put zero because there is no uh, secure channel. So everything is on clear text. Uh, so this two-way handshake is uh, mostly used in point-to-point uh, -point protocols. Uh, so the problem is obviously that the password is clear text and can be easily sniffed. And also the password can be reused by another entities for the same authentication to get the same service. Uh, to solve the clear text problem, uh, encrypted PAP is introduced. So the, the mechanism is pretty much the same. The only difference is that the username and password are encrypted and sent over the server. So it's still direct. Uh, direct authentication sends the credentials over the channel, still encrypted, but it's encrypted, but it's still it sends the actual credentials. Uh, shared knowledge is symmetric, but we put B, which means uh, the secure channel is, is established before, uh, before the authentication, which means we have encryption and send the credential through the secure channel. And the little s means that the encryption the secure channel is based on shared key. Uh, so the problem with the encrypted PAP is that if there is a man in the middle, it can capture the credentials even if it's uh, encrypted, and later, uh, without awareness of the client, can replay the credentials uh, to the server and get access. Uh, so this two-way handshake is still uh, used in, uh, p uh, is useful for P2P protocols. Uh, it solved the clear text password problem, but is, it still has the problem of man in the middle and the uh, trust channel is an issue. Uh, so next pattern is challenge handshake authentication protocol, CHAP, uh, which is an indirect one. So the main difference is that instead of sending the credentials directly, it sends indirectly the uh, proof that I am the uh, authentic user. So in this pattern, the server challenges the client with a nonce, and then the client using the shared, the symmetric shared knowledge calculates the response and send it back to the server. So with this, the server can verify that the answer is correct and, uh, verify and uh, authorizes the client. So this three-way handshake is used in uh, Wi-Fi web networks, and the nonce uh, defend, uh, protects against that uh, man in the middle and reply attack, because nonce is different every time. If the man in the middle capture the uh, capture the challenge or not, next time that would be a different one. So it cannot authenticate itself to the server. Uh, but the problem is still that uh, in this scenario, server authenticates the client, but the client does not know the server is the authentic server. So there's no mutual authentication. And also the client have to uh, clients have to uh, repeat this process, this negotiation, every time for every single request. 
so that brings us to four-way handshake, which is an ISD. Uh, so the four-way handshake is pretty much the same as the CHAP, but the point, the, there are two main differences. One is that both server and client authenticate each other um, using the PMK, pairwise master key. So it's still symmetric share, shared knowledge be between these two. Uh, so the server challenges the client and the client also challenges the server to, to make sure that they both are on the same page. Uh, the second uh, difference is that the PTK, which is the session key, so the client creates a session key after authentication, the, the communication is happening uh, using that session key to encrypt the communication. Uh, so basically authentication is happening and the secure channel is established after authentication. So that's the T is after authentication. So uh, this, this pattern is used in Wi-Fi uh, WPA2 uh, which uh, solves the problem of mutual authentication, but still PMK is shared with everyone. For example, in a Wi-Fi network, everyone knows the PMK, the, the master key, the, the wireless password, say. And if, if you walk into a coffee shop and someone is already sitting there and connected to the network, it's got the PMK. So once you request for, the, uh, for authentication, that, uh, that Note can calculate your session key as well and sniff your communications. Uh, at this point, I hand over the presentation back to Farbo to talk to you about the importance of secure channel. Right, thanks. Um, so let me um, like let's ask yourself what are we doing here? Let's not lose the sight of everything. Uh, we demonstrated we're, we are going through different patterns and we're looking at the evolution of patterns here to find those um, common elements there. So every pattern that we look at, we could actually spe specify all of these in uh, like formal methods, but that wouldn't be at, as helpful. We, the reason that we took these patterns out of context uh, was that we wanted to show these ideas behind this. You may ask yourself, why would we need um, a simple pattern like this, because in some of the IoT applications, it's inevitable to use them. There are some devices that cannot do anything more, more than like point-to-point uh, -point authentication. So when we look at all these patterns, uh, if you look at the pattern um, notation on the top, you see that we have, we, have, we have been able to identify those features that uh, I explained in the beginning and then assign one um, acronym to each of them. So we looked at these different patterns and we identified the problems that we, we could associate with them and the security problems that we had. So next time that you see that one of these patterns is, is used in any of the, for, like in any of the IoT uh, scenarios or for any of the IoT applications, any of the technologies, you realize that something could go wrong. And then by knowing that uh, what could go wrong, then uh, you can probably take care of that with some additional security measures. So we looked at all these patterns and we, and we could assign uh, an acronym to all of them, ISD. But one another thing that we uh, figured out, found out, was that the establishing a secure channel is as important as the authentication itself. Actually, there's no value in authentication. I told that in the beginning of the presentation. There's no value in authentication if we cannot establish a channel after that. Let's look at, for example, one of the um, patterns that we went through. What was wrong with this chap uh, scenario? So you send the nonce, the uh, client sends, um, encrypts the nonce, with, uh, encrypts the channel, sends back to server, and server accepts or rejects the request. But what can we go from there? No, nowhere, because uh, still with the next request, you still have to repeat the same thing. You have to send the channel, you have to uh, sign it, send it back, and then send the request. So the value of authentication in my opinion, is uh, the channel that it helps us to build. Uh, so again, in general, there's no escape from building a secure channel. Trust is still sustained. After you do the authentication, 
everything is relate is uh, dependent on the channel. So you still after you, what happens after you do the authentication? You get an access token, and with the next request, you have to just send that access token. So that your security, you you will be as secure as your access token. And so now we look at the different ways of uh, establishing a secure channel, and then we we'll look we we'll look at the uh, brilliant ideas of uh, building a communication channel and a secure channel. Uh, one of the greatest ideas that has been put forward in the history of, I think, security has been Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Um, and the family of algorithms that are similar to Diffie-Hellman. And the idea behind Diffie-Hellman algorithm is that I want to um, build two entities, want to build a secure channel between each other without, knowing, without having any shared knowledge. And the brilliance of um, Diffie-Hellman is that you can talk to someone on a secure channel without having anything in common. And if someone comes between you, even if someone has been there for the entire time, that person cannot um, decrypt the, your communication. And how, is, how does it work? It works like this. Like this, in the simplest form, suppose that I want to talk to Amir. I generate a pair of keys, private key and password, uh, pri private key and uh, public key. I send the public key to Amir, and then I ask Amir to generate a random number that he only knows, and then encrypt that and send to me. Because I have the public key, private key that I have generated, I can decrypt that, and then from that moment, we can use that uh, random number to communicate. So if someone is here, an entity, am I in the middle, if someone is here for the entire communication, they cannot, they cannot decrypt the communication then, and they, they cannot intercept the communication. So that is the idea behind Diffie-Hellman. We call this pattern 00B because it doesn't have any shared knowledge. It doesn't uh, obviously do any uh, symmetric or asymmetric verification of that knowledge. And it's, it only builds a channel. And it builds a channel before authentication. But it could be a very valuable basis for the authentication, for the next step of authentication. Um, so we have different uh, var variations of Diffie-Hellman algorithm. In ephemeral uh, Diffie-Hellman algorithm, we, use, uh, we generate different private keys each time. There is a huge overhead because of that. Uh, but it has forward secrecy because if um, one of the one of the next uh, key set of keys are stolen, then they cannot go back and decrypt all of the uh, session and access all of the data that uh, all, the, all of the previous data. Um, but it had a very uh, huge overhead and an elliptic curve. DH, uh, these are all, all details. Um, I think that will, this presentation will be will be uploaded somewhere, and then you can look, look at all of these. The, um, uh, in ECDHE, uh, there have been some algorithm to make the calculation of key faster, and it has also forward secrecy. And, but uh, DH doesn't provide any authentication. We, we, were able, we were able to build a secure channel, but we didn't have any authentication. What could we do after that? We can build a secure channel, and then we can do authentication using any method over that. One of the um, common method is uh, RSA ECDHE. Uh, it means that we establish the channel, and then uh, we use RSA keys or any asymmetric algorithm to sign um, a message, and then through that we can authenticate the other part. Um, so why do we call this pattern IAB? Um, I want to ask you to, when, like, when you look at the pattern, just think about those three axes. Uh, this is indirect verification because we, we this is I because indirect ver because of indirect verification, uh, we don't uh, send over the shared knowledge. The shared knowledge is, sim uh, is asymmetric, IAB, I'm talking about IAB, and the B means that the channel is established before the authentication is started. So the channel could be established regardless of failed or successful authentication. And the final pattern that we, are, we want to present is the new family of patterns uh, that is called PAIC, and is used in Threat Protocol and ZigBee Protocol in very new IoT protocols. And in, um, th there's been a 
very nice innovation in those type of patterns, and uh, they have enabled us to use symmetric authentication with the same ideas as before. So it has a very low uh, compu computational requirement. It's, it's a new family of algorithm that enables us to authenticate the other, the other part and build a secure channel, but without use of any asymmetric algorithm. No public key management or has, it has forward secrecy. The most important thing is that it also has forward secrecy. Um, take is used uh, in threat protocol, a, a, a variation of PAKE uh, that is called uh, JPEG, PAKE by juggling is used in threat protocol. Also, Zigbee can use uh, SKKE, which, is, uh, which has the same um, characteristics of PAKE. So, how much time do we have? So finally, you'll look at uh, different protocols and technologies, and we'll see how these patterns are used uh, in practice in those uh, IoT technologies. We'll look at XMPP, we will look at different message keying protocols, Zigbee Thread, um, RFID, and um, Hypercat and UDDI. Just very quickly, uh, should I? Um, so X7PP protocol, I'm sure that you're familiar with this, is a uh, XML-based protocol that uh, IoT devices use to send messages. Uh, it's based on SASL, and SASL has a, um, a stack of different type of authentication, but when we went through all of those patterns of, um, that are used in SASL, we, real we realized that we can map them to one of the patterns that we had shown in the previous slide. So in SASL, for example, I, I would ju just explain a few of them. Um, in SASL, you can have plain, clear text use of password, which is isolated, DS0. Or if you go down the uh, list, you'll have OAuth, that, which is centralized in direct verification, either by sym symmetric or asymmetric, and uh, the channel is established before. And then you have federated ISP. I have to, we have to go through the details of each of these. We, we won't have time, but I think I'm sure that this presentation will be somewhere soon. And you will actually do the exercise yourself, and you can look at the patterns and identify these different features in them. Um, so I think Amir will explain uh, the publish and subscribe architecture. Uh, so, sorry. yeah. Uh, so at this point, I would like to uh, talk about publish subscribe arch architecture as an example of that three topologies we talked about in authentication, uh, centralized, isolated, and uh, federated. So generally, publish subscribe uh, protocols, if you are not aware of, uh, are messaging, uh, messaging communication patterns in which a single broker is responsible for message delivery. So. Uh, specifically in IoT environments, publish subscribe is very uh, useful and practical uh, since we've got uh, low powered, very thin nodes which cannot uh, do lots of computations. For example, a, a temperature sensor senses the temperature, sends it to a server, and it sleeps. And so the, the nature of IoT, is, IoT devices is that they are very weak and the connection the, uh, between these nodes are usually intermittent. So a resourceful broker in between can handle everything for them. So simply publishers publish a message to, the, to a specific topic to the broker and subscribe, subscribers, which are other devices or services or servers, can subscribe to those topics and fetch those messages. Most of the... Uh, uh, publish subscribe uh, protocols use SASL uh, for authentication purposes. So here the point, uh, here I want to show an example of those three uh, authentication topologies we, we talked about, isolated, centralized, and federated. So in isolated identity management and authentication, uh, the, as, as, we, as we said, the server and the authenticator or the resource are both the same. So here the broker authenticates every, every, node, every node around it. Uh, so there is a single service and a single authentication. 
So it's very simple to realize, but the drawback is it's not very scalable, and obviously it's single point of failure. If the broker fails, uh, any authentication in the system fails. So to solve that problem of uh, scalability, uh, we uh, the, another another uh, topology, which is uh, centralized identity management, has been evolved which means there, there is a separate authenticator. Every entity in, this, in the system authenticate to that single authenticator. So multiple services in one domain can authenticate to that server and communicate with other entities. But still, there is the problem of the single point of failure. We still have single authenticator. It's separate from the resource, but still single authenticator. To overcome this issue, uh, there are multiple authenticators added in, in different domains. So uh, multiple services can, uh, can use their, uh, their authenticator to authenticate everyone else. Uh, so uh, different domains can be, uh, can be integrated and so that makes the system more uh, efficient and scalable. Uh, single sign-on, as, as I mentioned, is one of the examples which we are using every day. Um, this, uh, this flexibility is with the cost of more complexity to the system. So at this point, uh, so knowing all of these, now Farbod is going to describe few specific protocols which are used in IoT and uh, compare the authentication pattern. The first protocol is ZigBee. Yeah, again, uh, we look at different patterns and uh, we end it with the PAIC uh, pattern that we could use uh, symmetric, authentic symmetric authentication in and uh, we could get all of the benefits of asymmetric authentication uh, that we had in all the in the SSL communication. Uh, so PAKE is used in Zigbee and PAKE is used um, in Thread too. And there are also uh, great ideas that have been used in Zigbee protocol and both uh, Zigbee and Thread. And uh, I start with Zigbee. Uh, do you know that Zigbee is a low power wireless mesh network? Um, it's an alternative to Wi-Fi for low capability devices. And it has two um, stages of discovery and joining. And each device comes with a preloaded uh, key. And as we explained, it uses SKKE, which is very close, like in its features and characteristics, it's very similar to a uh, PAIC algorithm. And it uh, has IST in our patterns, has IST pattern, which means that it uh, does indirect verification of the shared knowledge. Um, it's based on symmetric keys, and the channel is established after the authentication. And it uses a federated model of authentication because of different routers. Um, as a result of authentication, there are different keys that are generated. Uh, network key is common between all nodes. Link keys are uh, pairwise nodes, and master keys are um, the, the shared knowledge that is loaded into the devices. Another example is Thread Protocol. Uh, again, Thread Protocol uh, is used in the Nest devices can either use wireless or they can use Thread Protocols if they are low, capa uh, low capability and low power. And uh, it's also another uh, 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 an alternative to Wi-Fi protocol. Uh, there is another new concept that is um, introduced in Thread Protocol, and that is the concept of commissioner that does the authentication. The commissioning has two stages. First, the commissioner has to be authenticated, and then the, all the devices um, authenticate to that commissioner. Uh, so if we want to describe this in terms of the patterns that we uh, propose, uh, it's, uh, th there are two stages. The commissioner has to authenticate to network. The, the commissioner doesn't have to have the, all the network keys, but it uses centralized ISP, and then after it's, uh, after it's authenticated using the commissioning passphrase, that is a symmetric um, shared knowledge. Um, everything else um, authenticates to that uh, node. And then again, it's a, both the stages are uh, centralized ISP. Uh, thread uses JPEG as a set, um, 
uses juggling in the page, and, but it still has the same pattern, uh, indirect verification, symmetric keys, and the um, channel is established before the authentication. What's the difference between channel before the authentication and after the authentication? If the channel is established before the authentication, if the authentication fails, you still have the channel. But if you, the um, channel is established as a result of authentication, you cannot have failed authentication and have a secure channel. So the last class of examples that we see is RFID and NFC. The reason that uh, we put RFID and NFC here was that these are examples of very low power devices that cannot do anything. And we see that there are, path there are cases, there are scenarios that we don't have any other options except using the simplest form of authentication. There are three possible ways of authenticating in um, RFID systems. Uh, the RFID needs to authenticate the reader, the reader needs to authenticate the RFID. And in the simplest form, the server with each request only sends the password, and this is uh, the DS0 password. If we use the cover coding, a, a method of encryption between the RFID and this um, reader, um, we have DSB. And then another method is based on indirect verification. There will be one key that is on RFID, uh, and we have the same key on the reader, and then they, see, they send, send a random number and it, we call that IS0 or ISV based on the encrypted channel. And the cover coding is very simple. It's only XOR, if you're familiar with RFID. Um, it only uses a, cover, a, very, a simple form of authentic, um, securing ch secure channel, and that is only XORing that with a random number. Um, so in RFID, we have the same patterns. Uh, we have a simple pattern of, as I said, password, isolated password uh, that, sent, that is sent uh, by each request to the reader, uh, to the tag. Uh, it's e easy to eavesdrop, it's easy to sniff because it uses RF uh, communication. And then um, it's easy, easy to brute, brute force. There's no solution to that. You, have, you can have tens of RFID tags here, and then you can have a reader that sends the kill command to all of them with different passwords, and you can brute force them. Uh, but it's, sometimes it's the only possible solution. You have to accept the risk. And then, as I said, you, can, you have the same patterns that we showed, uh, like sending, with, with sending a nonce. It, this pattern is used, it can be used in RFID. We're trying to show that these are the patterns. These are the only possible patterns. And then uh, they are repeated in actual applications, in actual protocols and technologies. And finally, for example, it would be, it would be ideal if we could use asymmetric algorithm on the RFID, but uh, most of the RFID tags could not um, carry out any asymmetric algorithm. So this is, a, this is an example of where you know what the best pattern is, but you cannot implement that on the device. So I want to conclude our um, entire discussion here. Again, I want to uh, ask you to um, try to uh, identify these different features when you look at different patterns of authentication in IoT or in any other context. Um, we talk about direct and indirect verification of a scale. We talk about asymmetric or symmetric scale, and we talk about um, the channel, establishing the channel before and after the authentication. And then we, we told that there are three different uh, types of identity management, isolated, centralized, and ferreted, and um, all of these different patterns, uh, different characteristics uh, bring their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we show that there are numerous technologies, different technologies. Uh, patterns help us to uh, gain a common understanding of those, uh, of, of the characteristics of the um, technologies. And uh, we try to propose and build a feature space that facilitates classification using these um, spe specific features. Uh, the advantage of having a feature space is that it, by looking at these letters, these acronyms, it, um, they immediately highlight the security requirements and the computational power that we need. Um, the summary of what we learned was that if we, like, when you, now when you see that some pattern uses direct verification of a scale, you know that you have to put more emphasis on the secure channel it may exhaust uh, SK by reusing it. 
And if, if you have asymmetric SK, then sometimes you need more computation power. Um, again, for secure channel, if it's, it's affected by the choice of SK, and then you have to look at sniffing replay attack, relay attack, and forward secrecy. These are the things that you have to ask yourself each time you come across a new uh, pattern. And then we have ICF, um, um, centralized, in, um, isolated, and federated, and then you have to ask a question about the, how you want to manage the keys, and then do you want to have a single point of failure uh, or not? So the presentation summary, we highlighted the importance of identifying patterns for authentication. We propose a feature space. We analyze various patterns and show the security problems with them. And we demonstrate how these patterns are used in various technologies. And now, if you have any questions, we'll be more than glad to take them. So if you have devices that have um, a lot of computation power, like you know RAM, CPU, whatever else they need, and battery, um, is there an ideal solution for like a high-powered environment where you don't have the constraint on the endpoint? I so think we, uh, like good, channel, I good question. Um, I think the high-powered devices are like the servers that we have on web application. We can put all of the different security measures there, you, you, can, you should use SSL and then you should use asymmetric algorithm and the symmetric algorithm, you, have different, you can have different layers of uh, authentication. Uh, you don't need to use any of the new innovation like, like the ones that we had in JPEG, we had, we, we had in Threat. Uh, it will be like the traditional server, client server model that we have. Any other questions? No. Okay. Um, thanks for your time and thanks for coming and hope that you have gained something from this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you.